Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Quiet, numbskulls. I'm broadcasting. Can we get serious now? One thing that did happen during the 60s was some music of an unusual or experimental nature did get recorded and did get released. Now look at who the executives were in those companies at those times. Not hip young guys. These were cigar chomping old guys who looked at the product that came and said, I don't know. Who knows what it is? Record it. Stick it out of it. So, all right. We were better off with those guys than we are now with the supposedly hip young executives who are making the decisions of what people should see and hear in the marketplace. Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. In the studio with us today here on Another edition of the Business Side of Music, Vincent James, who we actually met at Summer Nam uh, this past July here in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, he was there at the show, came by, stopped by our booth, said hello. Vincent, welcome to the show. Thanks, Bob. Thanks for having me on. And it was great meeting you this summer. Same here. You are the founder of Keep Music Alive, which really, I guess, has a lot of, I don't want to say tentacles, but maybe that's... Uh, maybe that's not <laughs> oh, the you word. Could say, you could say tentacles. Okay, it's sure, got a lot of not? tentacles. Uh, <laughs> you, you guys have your, your hands in a lot of different projects. And we're going to talk about most of them. Hopefully, we have enough time to get that done. How did you get started with Keep Music Alive? And, and what's that all about? So it's a funny story, Bob. Uh, I was listening to a teleseminar about seven years ago. And the uh, subject of the teleseminar where, well, teleseminar was how everybody has a book inside them that they need to write. And honestly, I never thought I would write a book. It's like by day, I was an engineer. By night, I was doing all these different music things throughout my life. So never really focusing on any one thing long enough to be consider what I would see as an expert. But something drew me to listen to this call. And while I was on that call, I got the idea, well, what about a book of inspirational stories of how music changed people's lives? Well, first of all, I wouldn't have to write anything. If we could just reach out for stories, bring them in, and then we would need to edit them and then publish the book. And that's exactly what we did. And that's how the book series, 88 Ways Music Can Change Your Life, started out. And that was the beginnings of Keep Music Alive before Keep Music Alive even was anything. And then about a year, right before we published the book, March 2015, there should be a week every year where musicians everywhere, music stores and whatnot, offer a free lesson to new students just to try to get them started on playing an instrument. Because sometimes you just need to sit somebody down in front of the piano, put the guitar in their hand, turn the amp up, a little distortion on, put the pick in their hand, just show them a couple of things. You know, whatever you think will draw them in, you know, whether it's the drumsticks, brass, woodwind, whatever it is, uh, and just try to get them started. And that just began to grow year over year. You know, we started inviting music schools, music stores. And then I ran into a gal who was doing something called Kids Yoga Day. And, of course, I heard Kids Yoga Day in my mind. You know, the wheels just start spinning. Well, what, what about Kids Music Day? I wonder if there is such a thing. So, I, you know, go to our friend Dr. Google and, you know, no such thing. Well, I'm like, there is now. So, when I think 2016, we had the first annual Kids Music Day. And what we do for that is we, again, you know, invite music schools, music stores, and music organizations, initially just the U.S. and then Canada, and then we've now out to at least a dozen countries. And we encourage them to hold some sort of event or promotion that benefits or celebrates kids playing music. You know, everything from an instrument petting zoo, instrument donation drive, kids open mic, a student performance, either in-house or out in the community, even like a kids, day, a kids music day sale on instruments or lesson programs. And we're doing this not, not only just to draw more, you know, kids and families into, you know, getting involved in playing music, but also to get the media talking more about it, about the importance of it. So Teach Music Week in March and then Kids Music Day in October give us two tent poles. You know, we can, you know, shout out to the media, you know, from the top of the mountain, just try to get them talking about it more. So the more families, you know, will pay a little more attention and, and try to get, you know, their kids involved in playing music. And we're really just all doing it because we know the benefits that the kids are going to receive in the end. You brought up something that I'm surprised somebody has not done before. And that is you, you mentioned instrument donations. A lot of us, you know, as kids growing up, especially my generation, because we actually had we had concert band, we had orchestra, we had all those things in elementary and middle school, junior high school and high school because the funding was there back in those days. Right. The schools could yep. could finance it and support it. 
And I know that up until probably 20 years ago, I still had my trumpet sitting in the closet. And I finally gave it to someone. And my son was the same way, wanted to play saxophone, didn't know if he was really going to be accomplished at it or not. I didn't want to go out and spend a lot of money on a brand new sax. So we found someone who basically just about gave it to us. I think we maybe spent forty, fifty dollars on this saxophone so he could learn from it. it. wasn't a great instrument, but it was a great way to start. And I've always wondered why don't those of us who have all these instruments sitting in storage in, in a closet or in a garage or whatever, why don't we continue to put those to good use? So is that what this is all about? Is is gathering those instruments and getting them into the right hands? Now, anytime that there's an instrument donation drive, that's, that is what there is. Now, there are a couple of national organizations that do that year-round. Uh, there's Hungry for Music and there's Acoustic for a Change. That year-round, they're collecting instruments and putting it out into underserved community schools and just getting it in kids' hands, you know, at no charge. And, you know, we'll do, you know, our own instrument, you know, local instrument donation drive, and then we'll get it into the hands of one of those programs because we don't have a method. Our hands are kind of full right now doing what we're doing, so we don't have a process yet to distribute it to the right places. But, yes, you know, there are a number of organizations that do this, but not enough people that have those instruments in their closets, Bob, think about it. You know, I mean, myself, I had a trombone in the corner for 20 years. <laughs> like, when was I ever going to, you know, I play piano and play guitar. Am I ever really going to pick up the trombone again? I guess maybe part of me wishes that I would. But the reality is, you know, put it to good use now. And then if I decide I want to play the trombone again, I'll go out and buy it, you know, buy another one. Well, and I think it also comes down to as we grow up, we become adults and we kind of get into that real world of we got to work every day to, to pay the bills. Yep. It's not that we necessarily lose interest. We lose time and we just don't have that opportunity, like you said, to pick up the trombone or myself, pick up the trumpet or a string bass or whatever instrument I'm wanting to go back and play after all those years. So putting it into the hands of young, fresh minds that, you know, they're very malleable. You, you can mold them and shape them. And music, as we all know, is a great unifier for, for everybody. And yes. I think that getting instruments into kids' hands is such a great thing. And then you also talk about the music stores. And I love that. Getting getting kids into a music store. First of all, it's to me right off the bat, it benefits two places. It benefits the music store because now you're getting foot traffic in there. But it's also once again, getting that young person in there with mom and dad or whoever it is and saying, you know, I just put a pair of drumsticks on my hands and I beat on a drum pad or a snare drum or a full set. And I'm horrible at it, but man, this could be fun and I'd love to do it. <laughs> and so you start at least creating some momentum to get them that next step. Yes, yes. And that's and that's exactly what we do with our third program, which is something we do year round in our Philadelphia area. And sometimes we do travel and it's the musical instrument petting zoo. And I would love to say that we coined that idea. But, you know, we saw another organization doing that and we're like, this is that is gold there. Just that idea. It's just such a cute brand, you know, tagline to bring people in. And, and for us, we bring guitars, ukuleles, keyboards, dozens of different types of percussion instruments. Sometimes we bring violins if we have a volunteer that, that can play. And it's really like a please touch museum for musical instruments. The kids can come in, you know, put their hands on different, different keyboards and you know, try the different settings, put guitars in their hand, put the pick in their hand, show them how to make a sound, show them how to play a note, you know, put a little fuzz on the amp if that's something they're interested in. Just again, you're just kind of lighting them up. You see the smiles and the joy in their face, and like kids are like looking at mom, looking at dad, and grandma, and grandpa, whoever brought them. Like you know, they, you know, when can I do this? Yeah, you know. Yeah. And and at these events, there's no pressure. You know, you're not in a store where you're feeling like you have to buy. Although sometimes we have parents that'll be like, "Can we buy this from you?" No. <laughs> this store and that store, you know, down the street here. But yeah, just lighting them up, getting them excited about it. And, and when you walk into a music store, it's even a bigger, it's like the hugest musical instrument petting zoo because they have literally 10 times what we're able to bring, you know, traveling around. And just, you know, the creativity that, that you see lighting up the young minds, like you said, putting the drumsticks in their hands and letting them beat on a drum kit, which we're not able to bring a whole kit. 
we bring a snare and sometimes we have to we did a show at the uh, rock and roll hall of fame instrument petting zoo and after a little bit we had to actually put the snare drum away because it was too loud <laughs> in, in, inside and they were taking tickets you know they had tickets being taken on the other side of the room uh and it just <laughs> but the kids love banging on the snare drums and once again it's that first impression getting that you know i think when when you get the instrument in their hands the rest is almost up to them whether they want to take that next step and move forward but the yep. biggest step is getting that instrument in their hands yeah lighting, lighting the spark yeah do you find that when you do this that it's who's more receptive is it the kids or is it the parents we well, you know uh, we see a mix you know sometimes we see a kid that's really really into it and the parents are just kind of giving you like a lukewarm like johnny can we go yeah. and the kids like you know they want to stay here you know all, all day you know right. we have kids running back from the rock hall you know running away from the exhibits because they wanted to come back to the petting zoo but then sometimes you have the kids would be like just like ah, like you know this is okay but then you see the parents the light bulb starts going and their mind starts going, they're like thinking, well, hey, you know, would you like to try this? You know, some of the, a lot of times you can see they had some musical history in their past. And it's kind of like rekindling that a little bit and saying, you know, maybe they're Johnny or Mary or whoever it is wants to, you know, get started playing, whether it's on the instrument they play it or just something else. Because, you know, face it, music brings out the child in us at times. And you bring, you know, parents into this environment where they see these kids having a ball playing these musical instruments and just, you know, getting involved with them. You can't help but kind of relive a little bit of your childhood and get a little bit excited for your, your child and grandchild and, and kind of maybe want to propel you to take that next step. It also, it is another resource for parents to use to get the kids away from video games. If you can't, if you can't get them outside, you can at least get them on a musical instrument and get them away from that video game. Anything we can do, Bob, to get them away from a screen, you know, for as much time as they spend on, on a screen is, is good. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to take a break, get a word in with one of our sponsors, and when we come back, we're going to have some more conversation with Vincent James. Hey, everyone. This is Nicole Hoagland from MCR Crowdfund. Make sure you check out our episode on the Business Side of Music podcast. You're listening to the Business Side of Music. When you have a Korg synth at your fingertips, the possibilities are endless. Be it digital, analog, analog modeling, altered FM, wave sequencing, or the multi-engine synth, Korg gives you easy access to a variety of features to help you get the perfect sounds quickly. Whether you're a professional musician or just starting out, Korg truly has a synthesizer to help you express yourself. Visit Korg.com or your favorite Korg dealer to get your hands on one of their products to create new music always. Korg, the official sponsor of the business side of music. Hi everyone, I'm Larry Butler, and I want to send you a free digital copy of my new book, The Singer-Songwriter Rulebook. 101 Ways to Help You Improve Your Chances of Success. That's right. Everything you need to know to launch your career as a singer-songwriter, all based on my 40 years in the live performance arena. And believe me, I've seen it all. In my book, you'll find the 10 things you have to deal with before even thinking about becoming a singer-songwriter-performer. You'll also learn about the five things every singer-songwriter can do this weekend to make their live show better. Five things I can guarantee that you are not doing already. Plus, there's tips on songwriting and staging, photo and video shoots, publishing, merch, dozens of other topics, all written for people who don't particularly like to read. And again, it's free. Just go to the Business Side of Music website homepage and look for my book cover. Click on it, and a free digital copy of my book will be yours. I'm Larry Butler, and I approve of this message. You're listening to the Business Side of Music. Back in the studio, Vincent James with Keep Music Alive is with us today. Music education advocacy. And how did you get started down that path? And we've touched on, you know, the, the, the musical instrument petting zoo and a couple other things. But the education advocacy, I mean, to me personally, I think that's a component that's missing. It's definitely missing in most of the schools these days. I think it's something that we really should be instilling in young people, not maybe necessarily as a trade craft, but at least as an elective, it's another option for you to look at. 
you know, maybe you will wind up being a carpenter or a fireman or, or, you know, a real estate agent. But music is a certain discipline that can lead into all of those things. Don't you agree? Oh, absolutely, Bob. It's funny, you know, you mentioned that, you know, we like to say we're not trying to turn every child into a professional musician. What we're trying to do is to give every child the best chance of success, no matter what career path they choose later in life. I mean, you know, the research research has shown you the kids that have, you know, music education and their young developmental parts of their life, you know, they do better in school, you know, better math scores, reading comprehension, better in science. Kids stay in school longer. Kids are excited to be in school if they have some sort of music and arts activity that's bringing them in. Uh, not, not just for the enjoyment of playing the instrument, but, you know, the camaraderie they have. It's almost like a sports team. You're playing in a band or you're playing, you know, singing in chorus. You know, you are combined with these other kids and sharing this artistic expression together and, and usually having fun along the way. I mean, many kids, you know, if it weren't for those music programs that they're in, you know, they would have limited opportunities for friends because they don't fit in these other buckets, you know, that many other kids might fit into. So we got into advocacy. You know, the book series started. It just kind of was like, it's funny, we started getting the stories in, and then as we started reading the stories was when we started realizing, you know, started peeling back the layers of the onion and realizing, wow, I think this is really something big. You know, it's like, I thought it was a good idea, but then as we got the stories in, it really hit home. I mean, literally, they would bring tears to our eyes. And then, you know, I would start looking at different research that have been done in different areas. And it just was just amazing me of how beneficial music is, you know, the educational benefits, the therapeutic benefits and the social benefits of playing music for kids and often for adults. So it's just, you know, we just kind of keep getting deeper and deeper into it. And, and I'm just more amazed the more that I learn. Let's talk about that. I'm assuming it's a book series. Correct me if it's wrong, but the 88 Ways Music, mm-hmm. that series, did that start off? from this book that you talked about of, of musical inspirations and expand from there? Or did it take a different track? Where did, where did that go? That is actually the book. Okay. Yeah, the first book was, you know, 88 plus ways music can change your life. And that was the original idea. And then we, you know, brought in stories, we edited them, we put them out. And then we kind of got rolling on, you know, Teach Music Week started and Kids Music Day started. And all the while, we were collecting stories for a, a potential new book that we just released earlier this year called 88 More Ways Music Can Change Your Life. And then we actually donate, keeping up with the advocacy of what we're really about, we donate 80% of the proceeds to four different music education and service nonprofits because we're just really trying to put as much as we can back into what we think is most important. Let me stop you right there. Uh, clarification, 80%? Yes. Wow. Yeah, there are four different organizations we currently uh, donate to uh there's uh, Hungry for Music, there's Musicians on Call, which brings musicians into hospital settings to play for patients. There's Rock to the Future, and then, and then our organization is the fourth one, Keep Music Alive. We you know, split it evenly four ways, just you know, trying to help all these organizations. We, we, wish, we wish we could do more, but as this grows, you know, we'll do as much as we can. What inspired you personally, and we've talked about it from an educational standpoint, what inspired you to... We know why you wrote the books. Now you've got two of them out, so it's a series. But what inspired you to go after these causes? Is this just an additional step forward into promoting music? I think for me, Bob, you know, music was always really important to me growing up. You know, I played trombone, as I mentioned, and started out in fourth grade. Just a funny, quick story. The first day, you know, they allow us to pick an instrument. I went home to my parents, you know, I want to learn how to play guitar. Well, the funny thing is guitar was not even one of the choices. <laughs> yeah, typically, to play typically is not, right. Yeah. Mom and dad said, no, pick something else. I came home day two. I want to learn how to play drums, which was on the list. They said no even louder. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we ended up with the trombone all through, you know, high school, jazz bands, uh, concert band, marching band. And then when I was around 10 or 11, my mom, as an adult, always had wanted to learn to play the piano. So she had a piano brought into the house and I was like a bead of honey. When can I start playing on this? And just the joy that I received, you know, through music, through my growing up years, teenager through high school, I just knew how important it was to me. And then I think it was just, you know, book idea was really just an idea. It wasn't like an advocacy thing at the moment. It was just like, hey, this would be a really cool idea. But again, as the story started to come in, you know, and the tears started to fall, you just really like, it just hit me that 
this is really what I was meant to do. And this is why I've been able to just stay on this straight line that we're doing with music education advocacy for now the last seven years. We're actually celebrating our seventh anniversary this uh, this weekend. Congratulations. Thank you. Kids Music Day Ambassadors. Let's dig into that one a little bit. How did that happen? So there was somebody we were talking to, one of our mentors that said, you know, you should have, you know, some of these famous people support you in some way. And we're like, well, gee, I wonder how that would work. <laughs> so, you know, we started reaching out, you know, we got a database of, you know, managers, agents and publicists and just started reaching out and just throwing, you know, fishing, throwing lines over the edge to see. And, you know, we started getting some, you know, some hits. Funny story is, and, you know, this relates to anybody who's trying to achieve anything, whether it's a musician or a music business, you know, it's to never give up because you just never know what can happen. We had been reaching out to a certain celebrity for a number of years, trying to see if they would offer a story or a quote for a book, you know, for one of our books. And we never got any response at all from any of their re representatives for like, I think, two, three years. And then finally, you know, we're like, you just, just keep trying different things. So we sent a request, you know, a question, you know, would they be interested in being a Kids Music Day ambassador? And I have to tell you, Bob, we were floored when we got an email back from Julie Andrews' representative saying she would love to be a Kids Music Day ambassador. And that just the floodgates kind of opened <laughs> from there. Yeah, you get that first one and others will follow. Yes, yes. And, it's, you know, we're just so very grateful, you know, that they lend their name and their image to help us promote Kids Music Day. And last year we even had a celebrity, Matthew Morrison, came to us and said, you know, we would like to actually be a spokesperson last year. And that's what got Kids Music Day on Entertainment Tonight, People TV and Good Day New York. It got a lot more exposure than it had gotten in the past. And this year, uh, Victor Wooten, who's a five time Grammy winner, signed on as a spokesperson and so he'll be doing interviews helping us get more exposure and victor is a, a champion for music education i don't know if you know you know he's just so positive about getting kids involved in playing music you know in addition to being an amazing musician himself so i was going to say just, as a as a jazz buff victor is right on the top of my list and i'm so glad to hear that he's getting involved at that level yes yeah we were beyond thrilled what is their role let's talk about what it is that those ambassadors exactly do so typically as an ambassador, they're, they're just lending their name. You know, they allow us to use their name and their image to promote what we're doing. They don't often grant interviews, but occasionally they will. And then but a spokesperson, you know, they're kind of saying, yes, you know, I'll actually take time and be available for interviews to help, you know, get more exposure for what you're doing. And, and I know, you know, as we continue on, as this grows, you know, I believe more artists will, you know, step in and want to be able, want to contribute just a little bit more and do interviews because you know, they all know what's important, that it's important. But I know that the representatives are also, you know, they're trying to protect their time and, you know, they're doing their job. We, we very much appreciate being able to, you know, have them available to show to that, you know, they're supporting this cause. Are there particular musicians, particular artists that you're looking for when it comes down to the Kids Music Day Ambassador? Are you looking for anybody or everybody across the musical spectrum? I think certainly, you know, we're open to across musical styles, you know, whether it's from hip hop to country to jazz to pop to classical. We want to embrace all styles of music, all style, you know, everything, anything that's positive in the world. And, you know, whether it's a younger artist, you know, or a classic artist, you know, you know they all draw from their own crowds, their own audience, and it helps to support what we're doing. We're going to take another break, get another word in for another one of our sponsors. And when we come back, we're going to have some more conversation with Vincent James with Keep Music Alive. You're listening to the business side of music. What does it take to succeed in country music? Hi, this is Candy O'Terry, your host for Country Music Success Stories. And this is JC Don Valeris, your Music City mentor. Our Nashville based podcast takes you into the homes and onto the back porches of country music icons. And the stories they tell us just might inspire you to make your country music success story come true. Check out Country Music Success Stories on your favorite podcast platform and subscribe today. Since 1963, Korg has been creating new experiences in music and performance. That is what drove the creation of some of Korg's most legendary products, such as the Poly 6, the M1, the Electribe, the Triton, the Minilog, the Kronos, Wave State, Op 6, and most recently, the Nautilus, which is what we have here in our studio. Korg is dedicated to creating new, innovative, and uncompromising instruments which maintain the highest quality to inspire music makers, past, present, and future. Visit Korg.com or your favorite Korg dealer to get your hands on one of their products and start creating new music always. Korg. 
the official sponsor of the business side of music. You're listening to the business side of music. Back in the studio, Vincent James, who is the founder, writer, the co-founder of Keep co-founder, Music, yes. co-founder of Keep Music Alive, is with us in the studio today. We discovered an interesting little thing about you that I want to talk about uh, that involved Hulk Hogan and uh, <laughs> Rowdy Roddy Piper and Cindy Lauper. You did something with. Uh, you did something with uh, wrestlers. Yes, yes, yes. So it's a funny story, and uh, I like to call this my baptism in fire of the, the, the music business. My in-laws at the time, back in 1985, were really into WWF wrestling. And so, you know, I would go over there and watch them yelling at the TV. And honestly, <laughs> I personally wasn't into it, you know. But, you know, I just saw the energy and emotion going into it. I'm like, yeah, this is a pretty interesting phenomenon. So as a songwriter, I'm like, it just I had to write a song about this. So, you know, I wrote a song called The Rock and Roll and Wrestling Connection. And in it, you know, in the lyrics, there were, you know, Cindy Lauper, who was, you know, making appearances and kind of pop culture connection with uh, wrestling, Hulk Hogan, Rowdy Roddy Piper. And so I had this song and then I went seeking out, you know, I found a studio to record a demo of it, got someone else to sing it because you know, I did not have that rock voice that this song really needed. And then I took it down to a local TV production studio. I was Prism Television in Philadelphia and they were responsible, I think, nationally for for filming and doing the World Wrestling Federation recordings. And, and then I also connected to the people down at the Philadelphia Spectrum, you know, where they held many of the matches. And the producer for those segments loved the song. He's like, I'm going to make a video out of this. And he literally put a video together with clips, you know, with Cindy Lauper, Rowdy Roddy Piper, and the Hulk Hogan, you know, from the different wrestling things that went on that went along with the song. And they played it, you know, on the air a bunch of times. They played it down at the Spectrum. The arena band was created out of this called Free Delivery. And they, you know, were going around local playing. We went up to the MTV offices, offices and... They said they were, you know, interested. I'm putting that in quotes, you know, right. get a little more happening and, you know, maybe we'll, we'll put this video on. Yeah. It's such a shame. It would have been awesome if they did just, you know, whether any money was ever made from it or not, it wouldn't have matter. I just think that would have been really cool. But it was a local phenomenon that happened here in the Philadelphia area and it was kind of, you know, I learned a whole lot about the business, you know, the good and the bad during those like 12 months. But I think once again, when when you talk about that learning the good and the bad that's part of that musical appreciation that a lot of people don't get to experience obviously you have your stories and i my stories you know some of them are very positive some of them are maybe not so positive but sure. that's that's how we grow in this business it's kind of a two steps yes. forward or three steps forward one step back you also wrote and released a song called Y2K, which wound up on the Jenny Jones show. For those of us that remember Jenny Jones <laughs> from the 1990s, let's talk about that one for a minute. So, you know, I have this novelty streak in me, Bob. Occasionally I'll just, you know, write a, you know, something that's novel. And obviously Y2K was a big cultural phenomenon that was happening leading up to the year 2000, uh, New Year's. So I wrote this song. Did a recording of it. Billboard magazine actually did a review on the song, which was very cool. And they gave it some positive spin, which was great. And uh, I went, got to fly out to Chicago and sing it on a Jenny Jones episode where they were, it was about Y2K. I was there in the green room with the toilet paper hoarders and everyone else. <laughs> it was, which, by it the was way, great. Those, those toilet paper hoarders are still out there. Yes, yes, yes. But uh, it was an you know, absolutely fun experience and a fun song. You know, I had a great time and, you know, I just had this little novelty. It just sometimes hits me and I have to I just have to put it pen to paper. <laughs> well, and I think that's, you know, we had uh, we had Mike Stewart on the show a couple of years ago who was mm -hmm. in the band that released Pac-Man Fever, which was a huge oh. hit in the in the early 80s. And, you know, I talked to, to Mike a few months ago and they're still out there touring. They're still out performing that song. So these novelty items, let's let's all remember, you know, the one hit wonders and the novelty songs. They believe it or not, they still have some some legs underneath them, you know, after all these years. Yeah, it's a lot of lasting power. I mean, Pac-Man will live forever in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> What's next for Vincent James and Keep Music Alive? What, what are you guys working on now? Uh, I think next for us really is just continuing to build up what we're doing. I think my wife says, you know, I need to swear off creating new holidays that, you know, we have enough going. <laughs> you know, right now we partner with about a thousand, just over a thousand music schools and store locations every year for Teach Music Week and Kids Music Day. Uh, but we still have a ways to go. I uh, you know to, in my mind, you know, when we finally get, you know, all the morning show, national morning shows and national night talk shows talking about music education at least a couple times a year, whether it's for 
Teach Music Week, Kids Music Day, or Make Music Day in the summer, which is another holiday that we support, then we know that, you know, we're not done, but at least we've reached a level that then we just need to maintain it. Uh, so we have a ways to go. How can people get involved f- from whether they have a musical instrument or they want to, you know, maybe make a donation to one of the organizations that you're behind? How can they get involved? The best way to reach us online would just be keepmusicalive.org. There they can, you know, get to Teach Music Week, Kids Music Day, find out about our instrument petting zoo programs, and find out also about instrument uh, donations and, and other ways to help support what we're doing. Very good. And that's the best way to reach you. Yes. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome, Bob. I appreciate you having me on. This has been a great conversation. The business side of music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow and is produced by Bob Bender. The business side of music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound design by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Busan. Never had one lesson. This tape will self-destruct in five seconds.